Hey guys, okay, so this is going to be the question and answers part two, which is going to be on resins. And I've just gone through and picked out some of the main questions I get asked by different people. I know I'm not going to answer all the questions that I get asked, so if you have something you really want to know, then leave a comment below and eventually I'll make a part two. So the first question I get asked is, how do I pick out which resin to buy? And how do you know what to buy? And all this stuff. Okay, so resins are a very person-oriented thing. Everyone's going to like their own type of resin. Just because you like something doesn't mean everyone else will and vice versa. You know, you have to figure out what you like. So step one is to go to like equine resin directory and look at everything that's out there. Sculptor, you know... Um, poses, breeds, all that different stuff, scales, and figure out what it is you like. Because if you can kind of start to get an idea of what you like, your buying experience will be easier because you won't be so sporadic and looking at so many things and being overwhelmed. You can kind of narrow yourself down and know what you're looking for. For instance, if you go on a Quine Resin Directory and realize you really like Sarah Rose sculptures, then you know you can go start looking for horses by Sarah Rose versus just trying to look at all the resins for sale in general. But it's going to be a heavily person-oriented decision. You should buy what you love, not what people tell you to buy, not what people else are buying. Buy what you love. Resins are an investment and they're not always cheap. So you really want to make sure you are totally in love with what you're about to buy because you don't want to regret it and you don't want to not be totally happy with that money you just spent. So make sure you are buying something that you want. That's my biggest recommendation is just before you just jump in and start buying resins because as I said in the last video, obviously it is more expensive sometimes. I mean one of a kind briars and things are different, but a lot of times it's more expensive than just going to the store and picking up a traditional or something like that. You know, you want to make sure you're totally happy with it and you want to make sure you're getting something that is going to fulfill whatever needs you are wanting, whether it be showing, shelf, picture show, uh, performance, whatever. You want to make sure that resin is going to be what you want. So just do your research before you start buying um, and kind of know what you want and kind of, you know, know what you want it for. I mean, you don't always know what you want a resin for. Sometimes it's like, I just want that resin. But to help when you're first starting, it's helpful to know what you want it for. Um, the next big question I get is, where do I buy resins and how do I get them? There's several different ways. The first way is model horse sales pages. The second way is I get a lot of my unpainted resins directly from the artist who sculpted them and then I get them painted. And then the other way is like through eBay and other sources. So let's talk a little bit about all of these. Okay, the first one I want to talk about is model horse. Okay, so as I was saying before my camera died, model horse sales pages. I want to talk a little bit about each of these avenues I buy and give you a little background of how to work all of these or some ground rules for them to say. Model horse sales pages. You have to be careful on model horse sales pages because you don't want to go around contacting sellers about horses you truly can't afford or you truly cannot afford to buy. I say that because there's a lot of people on there who are very sensitive to this type of thing and are going to leave you bad feedback and list you as a tire kicker and a time waster and you don't want that especially when you're trying to get into resins because you want to have a good history behind your name. So when you're contacting people on model horse sales pages if you are truly not looking to buy if you are really just wanting to see more photos of that resin and everything really you just need to be upfront and honest about it not all sellers are going to entertain you but if you can't afford to buy a resin you need to send them a message like hey I can't buy this resin at this time however I think it's really beautiful do you have any other pictures that I might be able to look at or a link or anything like that 
something that you can be straight up front with them about the fact that you are not trying to waste their time trying to buy this. You just want them to know you want to see more photos. Now a lot of people are rolling their eyes because they think that's funny because if you want to see more photos, you can see more photos. A lot of people, not all, but a lot of people will take the question for more photos as interest to buy um, because a lot of people on there are ready to sell and they want to sell. So an email is like a, you know, when you're asking for more photos, they're thinking you're seriously considering to buy and then they might get upset when you're like, okay, thanks for the photos, that horse is really pretty. So that's why I always say just be straight and upfront about your intentions because all it can do is help you in the long run. For buying resins directly from the artist, I cannot stress enough how important it is to read the artist policies. They have taken this time to type them up for you and to list it all out there and tell you all the stuff they think you need to know and it can make your transaction run a hundred times smoother if you read these. A lot of people don't read them because they're long, they're boring, but you might end up finding your question, your answers to your questions in those policies and a lot of the times you will. But it is, it's just really important to completely understand, especially ones like Sarah Meek who have difference between first come first serve and waitlist, reading her policies is key to having a smooth transaction in my opinion. Um, there's just a lot of stuff she color, covers in her policies that pops up. If you don't read her policies, you might not fully understand how the waitlist works um, or how first come first serve works and there's just a lot of things. So always take the time to read the policies. It's long, it's boring, but it will help you just gain a better understanding of what you're about to get into. Now, as far as painting goes from artists, that's kind of a whole new level, but it's the same thing. You need to read their policies because a lot of artists take a good bit of time to finish your models. And what I mean by that is I've seen some people um, that can paint in like one to two weeks on here. And that's great and I'm not saying anything about that, but a lot of artists cannot finish horses that quickly, especially artists who work a full-time job outside of horses. You know, it might take them a lot longer and you need to be prepared for that. And you need to be willing to give that artist time and not always ask for updates constantly and just allow that artist time to work. So do your homework on your artist. Research what turnaround time is. Are you willing to wait that long? Um, make sure you know their payment policies. Some require a deposit and some let you make time payments, some make you pay it off as soon as it's done. Make sure you know how your payments are gonna work. Another question I get asked a lot is, how do you pick which scale to buy? This goes back to question number one, where it's person oriented. Um, some people only collect stable mates, some people only collect classics, some people only collect traditionals. People like me, I collect everything. Um, so I'm moving more into the larger scales, and but I still have minis. You can also shape this to fit you how you want. A lot of people collect Stablemate resins because they can be a good deal cheaper. The unpainted cost is normally a good bit cheaper, and it's obviously usually cheaper to get them painted. Um, you want to make sure you do your research on mini resins because if you're going to get mini resins to show and your region doesn't split out traditionals for minis, you want to make sure you do have a competitive mini. Now it goes back to you still want to buy what you love, but when I say this I'm talking about I know a lot of people want to form a show string but only want minis because they're cost, more cost friendly and things like that. Do your research on the minis that do show well because there's a lot of them out there and you want to make sure that if you're truly getting them to show, one second, you want to make sure that you are getting something that's going to fulfill your goal. The next question is, you know, how do you get a live show quality resin? Live show quality is a subjective term, just like original finish, you know, paint jobs, all that stuff. 
it's going to be totally person oriented. And I know I say that a lot, but I mean, that really does show just how person oriented this um, group of model horse collecting really is because it's going to be based heavily on the person. Just like if you ever go to a show, what places at one show might not place at the next show. Does that mean it's not live show quality? No, but it just means that everything is going to be weighted differently in every other person's eye. So my biggest thing about resins is you want to make sure you have a good prep job on your resin before you get it painted or if you're buying a resin that it was prepped nicely because if the prep job wasn't good the whole resin is going to be thrown off. Um, you want to make sure all the seams were gotten and you want to make sure that it's a nice smooth finish and things like that. Unless that artist's style has a texture to it then that can change things. But the prep job you don't want falls in the primer you don't want seams and things like that. Um, the other question is how do you keep them from getting damaged when you're showing and stuff like that? Because I do show mine. The first thing I do is when I pack them, I pack them in pony pouches that I've made. Um, I picked a special fabric that won't bleed and won't stick to them if they get sticky. Um, for the heavier resins like my Ebrils and things like that, I use gun cases. Um, just because I feel like they give that resin a little more support. Because Ebrils are solid cast, so they are really heavy and really fragile. I feel like if something hits them in a gun case or something knocks them, they're a bit safer. At the show, I try to handle my resins with a little cloth at all times. Um, that way my hands aren't getting on my resin so much because one way you can really damage a resin over time without meaning to is just handling it so much with your bare hands because the oils from your hand get on the paint job and get on the sealer and at times it can make it fade or get dirty um, it's not something that's immediate but it can happen over time so I try to handle my resins um, as little as possible with my hands also at the show, if they're really tippy, um, I always lay them down. I don't risk standing up a tippy resin. It's not worth it because you don't want a resin to fall. I use my own version of those little stalls to put on your tables that I made. I use those to keep them from doing a domino effect and if they fall over, that way they should only hit fabric. Um, and on the show table, it applies to the same thing. If I feel that horse is a little bit tippy but can stand, I use sticky wax because people hit tables sometimes and it's not, it's, it can be an accident, but you want your resin to be sturdy. Also, I use, um, uh, a little cloth, a little piece of felt to lay them down off if, on if I don't even feel like sticky wax will do the job. It's just about being careful and not taking risk. Just because you're showing doesn't mean you want to stand it up just to get judged if that resin has a risk of falling. Because especially with fragile paint jobs, just falling over onto the side can cause paint to chip. So you want to be careful. I think those are the main questions I really get asked all the time. Um, I get asked a lot about what's the best type of painting method and everything, pastels, oils, airbrush. Again, I'm not going to go into this because it's a whole person-oriented thing. Um, you know, you might like pastels over airbrush. For me, it depends on the artist. I have mixed media. I have a little bit of everything on this table. I have a pastel, um, a couple airbrushes, and even an oils. So. I like everything. It just depends on the artist and how they use that media. Again, this is where you can start researching. Um, when you see artists you like, go look up their website. What does it say they paint in? Is, are you seeing a trend in what you're drawn to? The biggest thing before you start collecting resins, like I said at the beginning, is just doing your research and knowing what you like. Even if that's, like I said, 
equine resident directory or even at shows go up to people ask them i have people come up to me all the time and ask who did it who sculpted it who painted it what's it painted in and i don't mind i love answering the questions and you know i'm flattered for the artist and i'm flattered that you like my piece and a bunch of people are sometimes people are busy but if you can catch them on lunch or downtime normally they are more than willing to answer your questions so just don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to, you know, buy what you love because it's your money and it's your collection and ultimately it's going to be you that it needs to satisfy. So I hope some of these questions were helpful. Like I said, if you have more, you can leave them down below and once I get a handful of them, I'll do a part two for y'all. Otherwise, I will hopefully have a new video for y'all soon with something new that's about to arrive. Bye, guys.